There you go. Hit record, always a good idea. So I really wanted to kick off by, by with an opening question, I guess, which is that at the moment, I speak to a lot of people who are feeling a lack of hope right now like discouraged and i'd include myself in that actually more than i'm used to at the moment feeling feeling a feeling of not hopelessness but a lack of the hope that's ordinarily there in our day-to-day -day lives a feeling like discouraged a feeling of um confusion disillusionment with the world not really knowing how the world works but i don't really like it this way and and so i'd love it if you could just kick us off by by sharing with you with us like like what's like why is hope so important what is it and what, why is it so magical and where is it <laughs> all of those things please well, I, I think we can say we all know what it's like to be discouraged and feel hopeless. And it's no fun. Yeah. And there's different ways of talking about hope, but I think whenever I work with someone, the first thing I want them to do is have a sense of hope that things can change, that we have resources inside of us that are available, that can help. And those resources or that deeper intelligence doesn't depend on what we're feeling. So there's something deeper than our moods that go up and down and that when people start intuiting that or experiencing that does something for people that we're connected to learn and know and feel and sense that we're connected to a deeper intelligence that brings us what we need, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing. So I think it's, I mean, I, I, I know when we would get really discouraged, Sid would say, don't, don't ever lose hope. The learning the principles from Sid helped me to know where to look, where I could sense that there was something there I could rely on no matter what I was feeling, no matter what I was experiencing. And because it was unconditional, <laughs> it allowed me to have a hope that even when I got discouraged, I didn't lose hope even when I would be really in a horrible mood, I would know there was this connection to something deeper that I could rely on that is always there. So that's, that's the kind of hope I'm interested in. And I, <laughs> I wish it on everyone. Because like you said beautifully, Nick, we, we've all experienced what it's like to feel hopeless. And it basically means we have lost touch with that which is within everybody that when we recognize it brings hope no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening. So it's certainly relevant to each one of us. Yeah, I, I see hope as a, uh, as, as a, uh, not, not a ceiling, but a, I, I see hope as a, uh, 
as a floor that, that you can build on. Mm. So I see hope as, uh, is, is what exists when you, uh, when your spirits go up. The hope is, uh, when, when a person, when, when you say well, a, per, a, a person, spirits go, go uh, going up, it introduces a new dimension. It in, introduces a vertical dimension. And it's a spiritual dimension. So there are people who have no, uh, who have no possibility in their life, a very little possibility. Uh, but maybe they're very poor and they're in, in, bad, in bad health. And to them, it, hope is a lifeline. It's something that's beyond what they are, uh, what they consider as possible. That's the thing about hope. It, it's the impossible coming in existence. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, the impossible becoming real for people. That's how, that's how I, uh, that's how I see uh, hope. It's the, the impossible coming alive for people. So George, can you say a little bit more about what you mean by the vertical dimension, I guess, as a, as opposed to a horizontal dimension, like you said, it's a, it's a spiritual thing. It's a horizontal, it's a vertical. Yeah. Say, say a little bit more about that who, to people who well, the thing have is, come across that before. Yeah, Nicola, the, the thing is, uh, when, a, when a person goes to a higher level of consciousness, it, it introduces, introduces introduces them to an experience that they that they couldn't have at that lower level so at the at a higher level of conscious people see uh, po possibilities that just didn't exist at the lower level so hope is like a a ladder that can that, that can take you up and show you life that in 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 it will it will be new to you and it will be refreshing and it's really uh, I guess you could say hope is a is a form of intelligence. And it's an aspect of intelligence. And the vertical dimension is the dimension that takes people to, to visits people and, and takes them to hope. So that, that, so here's what I want to bear in mind what you've just both said, right? So if we, feels like we're walking around in a pit of gloom and doom, right? Feeling a bit hopeless. And like, how do we find hope? Like we know that, like, we just feel like there is no hope. Like, how do we find the ladder? I got really good at not finding it. <laughs> Cause I try to think my way to it. Yeah. And so I would feel down, hopeless, discouraged, upset. And I would do, 
even more thinking. And the more thinking I got, I stayed on the horizontal dimension. It was all just already known information and memory that I kept going through over and over and over again, trying really hard to figure out what I needed to do to get hope. Yeah. So I know, I know what not getting hope is, is trying to think your way to it. Yeah. And I think most adults that I see when they're having difficulty tend to think harder and yeah. think more. And it keeps people innocently off the ladder. And so I meet Sid Banks and he goes, everybody has what they're looking for, but they're looking in the wrong direction. They're looking in the direction of their thinking. And he says, it's before all of our thinking. It's in a quiet mind that we find what we're looking for. So as, as we begin to understand the value of quiet, when we're having difficulty, we do the opposite of what we had been doing. At least it was true for me, the opposite of what I'd been doing my whole life before that, trying to think my way out of being hopeless. And so this letting go or dropping into this quiet space within is where I suddenly discover this vertical dimension that George is talking about. And as my mind gets quieter and quieter, it feels like something deeper within me starts lifting me up in feeling and in knowing where I just know more, or as George is saying, I see more possibilities than I had seen before. So when there's less of me, there's more of, more of that, more hope, more ladder, more vertical, more possibilities. See, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, if you look at the, at the big picture, you you ask yourself where does where does hope live like what's what what uh where would you find hope what where does it live and it's interesting in if you if you consider that there's a lot of people who have absolutely uh, who, who, who are hopeless. And then there's people who have hope. And it doesn't come from, it, it, it comes from uh, a spiritual place. It, 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 there's no reason for people to have hope. But they do find hope. It's part of the human experience to experience, experience hope. And in one word I absolutely love is surrender. They talk about people surrendering to their plight. And, and I think that hope is, is tied into surrender. Mm -hmm. You know, when people uh, mm. surrender, when they, when they give up the struggle, mm. their spirits look right, right away will absolutely rise. So that's, mm. that's something that you can really, to, that, that's very hopeful to me to know that the only thing that keeps, keeps me struggling is not surrendering. So if I can surrender to, to life, uh, it's going to be 
uh, it's gonna it's it's gonna be a game changer. Yeah, and, and I and, and, and I uh, I. Uh, I, that's a very real, very real, realistic possibility for everybody. Everybody knows what it is to, to surrender to their, your plight and say, look, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, struggle any anymore and as soon as a person says sees that you'll see their spirits go up mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry nicola i yeah go ahead George. i knew that you were you were uh about to say thing it something and i and i'm sorry i i cut you off all of a sudden <laughs> no i think i cut you off george, no, it's fine, george. i loved what you were i love what you're saying about surrender george it's so misunderstood you know i wrote my doctoral dissertation on surrender george <laughs> it's it's it, it shows it's, you it shows you how how full of shit you are <laughs> when you were in those days <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me too. yeah i don't know what my my doctor they had a different criteria back then george yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well i what i loved in what you were saying i just wanted what i was going to say george uh, was just that what comes to me as you're both talking is from both what Dickin and george were saying it's like we, we, we are hopeless and we, we feel hopeless. So we walk around searching for the ladder and searching for the ladder. We're trying to find hope. Yeah. We're trying to find our way out of this horrible feeling. We're trying to find our way out of these horrible circumstances. We're trying to shake off this like gloom, doom mood, right? And, and so we're trying to find the ladder everywhere. And, and, and we can't find it. It's like, it's like it's invisible to us while we're looking for it, right? In our minds. But then... We give up because we can't find it. So at some point we give up, we surrender, we just give up. We, yeah. we just, we can't do it. We can't find it. So we give up. And when we do that, it's like the ladder finds us, right? Hope finds us. We can never find hope, but the hope finds us. That's what I'm hearing in what you're saying, but it ain't going to happen until you give up trying to find that ladder. Is that? And you can feel, you can feel the, the real relaxation that hope brings that when people surrender or, or when you say uh nicola when they give up they uh you can see it in their in their bodies and it it brings them a peace of mind and it's the peace of mind of not knowing that's what it really boils, boils out. And, and, and uh, I know that, that I was like Dickin. I was uh, a knowing machine. And the idea of surrendering was, I, I saw it as, as giving up on life. I, I had no idea what surrendering was. And I didn't realize that all it was, was it, it, it's the experience you have. You, if you have frames in a movie and, and you have a movie and you have frames, uh, what's between the frames is life and surrendering surrendering is what ha what happens when people uh, disengage from life and engage in um, a spiritual state that you might call relaxation 
that's what what I my when I think of surrendering, that was I was what I what I what comes to mind. It's a uh, you might say it's a form re of relaxation. It's yeah. between the frames in life. Mm -hmm. For me, it, it had to be an experience that became more familiar in its yeah. benefits. Yeah. Because I could relax, but I never relaxed when I needed it, like when I felt discouraged or hopeless. I could be thinking hard about something and then come back to the now, which is a fundamental form of surrender, because in the now you're not holding onto a single thought. And it's only... You can call that the unknown. It's going from the known, what we think, with all of our ideas and concepts and beliefs. And then there's this letting go of everything we think in those moments when we come back into the now. Or every night, people surrender in order, they're thinking in order to go to sleep. Yeah. And, but... I never used, to, I was very interested in surrender. Meditation for most people is a process of letting go of personal thinking and dropping into this quiet space that's full of possibility and potential. And yet, when my kids were yelling and I was having difficulty, I didn't think to do that because I didn't know the benefits of it. It was kind of a luxury in your mind. I didn't know that the vertical dimension, which means when you let go of everything you're thinking and you fall deeply into the now, yeah. was where everything is found. Yeah. So it, it's very interesting. Is there's so many metaphors that have been used, and we uh, people, you you just want to listen for the way in which this starts to resonate as in a sense, underneath all the thinking we do, there's a quiet space of presence. Yes. That's simple. The movement from thinking to that quiet place of presence is often what's been called surrender, or letting go, or dropping into the now, right? It's only there we find what we're looking for. Yeah. That's the, for me, that's the, key is an ordinary presence where I'm not holding a single thought. I don't care if my thoughts come and go. I still have them, but I'm not paying attention to them. And that's the relaxation yeah. that brings us into the space of presence where something new and fresh can break through and come to us. So that space is our spiritual dimension. And when we touch that space, as George says, it lifts us to a higher level. There's an inner shift that happens. I, I see it happen in myself and my clients over and over again as they start understanding deeper the nature of the mind. They start catching themselves, thinking into things in a way that keeps them in tension. Yeah, yeah. And when they know how that works, they keep falling away from that thinking and that tension into this relaxed, ordinary presence. And we begin to discover more deeply this spiritual vertical dimension. And then shifts well, happen. You know, I, I, I was realizing when I was listening to you, thinking, that I didn't realize how in a way, how how full of shit I was <laughs> when I was uh, pontificating about life. I just didn't didn't realize that there was something that was there that was 
uh, uh, behind it that was un almost unsaid. And that's what I was looking for. Mm. Mm. I was looking the, for, for the space be between the frames. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, was, I was looking in the wrong place for it. I mean, I didn't, when I, when I was uh, 1976, I didn't, I didn't know that there was anything other than uh, getting, getting stressed and then uh, going back to the game. That's what I thought life was, and 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 when, when I thought that when were people relaxing, were relaxing, they were just giving up on life. I know, I know this makes yeah. <laughs> it makes a little bit look like a dumb shit, but uh, that's that's what I thought. And when I met Sid, it turned it turned it uh, 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 it turned it turned it uh, how should I say it upside down uh, and turned it upside, upside down, down. It, yeah. it turned it upside down because it was that statement the last I'll show first and is uh, should be first in in the Bible because I just, oh, 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 did, did we no it's okay it's fine I, I fixed yeah. it uh, be, so I realized that I had it all upside down. That the times when I was uh, peaceful were the times that I, I was tempted to go, go back into the fray rather than to relax. And I remember telling my, my wife, Linda, she would talk about relaxation and I would be roll, rolling my eyes and mm -hmm. so what, the, what does relaxation have to do with anything? The idea is to, is to engage in, in life and, uh, and, and, and not relax. That's the idea. The only, I was thinking the ben only benefit to relaxation was, uh, it gets you ready to back, go back into the fray. I just didn't have the, the respect for re relaxation. I didn't have the respect for smelling roses. I didn't respect, have the respect for the power of the moment. Uh, that wasn't really part of my world in 1976 so practical what you're saying guys as well because i can't tell you how much i needed this call <laughs> today yeah. but it just made me realize like so so like i've been being discouraged about the whole kids constantly at home and homeschooling and then going back to school and then get called from school and they're sick and they have to come home and i'm just discouraged about ever getting out of this situation where not like nothing's getting back to normal and trying to figure out how to keep the kids happy when they're at home constantly and we're trying to juggle work and all the rest of it and and just f like I realize in listening to you guys that I've been feeling so down in the dumps about the whole lot and and as I'm listening to you guys I realize that I've been trying to think my way out into a better mood because right? if I could get in a better yeah. mood, then I'd be more fun around the kids and that would solve yeah. the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to think how to manage the kids, how to get them happy, how to get myself happy. I'm trying to find hope, essentially, and really failing. And then you come along and say, well, what if you just gave up? Right? Yeah. And then the first thought that comes to me is like, what, give up on my kids? They really want me to just give up on my kids? that's totally irresponsible. I can't because it would all go horribly wrong. And then the next thought I have is like, could I just do that? <laughs> and it's instantly, it's like the whole 
the whole thought thing that I've been in for weeks just crumbles. And you think, and, and you drop it all. And straight away, all of a sudden, without, where did that come from? This feeling of hope mm. and, and freedom and lightness. And that has just found me as I'm listening to you guys, like right here in this moment from, and just seeing that everything you're saying is making sense and is very practical in that way. God, if I love my kids, the last thing I want to be doing is thinking about how to cheer them up. Yeah right? <laughs> Trying to figure that one out. And, and, it, and, it, and to think that I'm being responsible by trying to figure it out with thought is, is, is a misunderstanding. But there's right there, there's a very practical example of how, how innocently yeah. and how, how we just go down the rabbit hole of trying to think ourselves into a better mood out of a particular feeling towards a solution that we think we know what we want totally in the known and but when you say like you could just give up then I'm back in the unknown because I don't I don't know what to do then yeah. and this and this and I still don't know what to do but there's a feeling of hope now that there hasn't been for ages it's like I'm getting my own personal coaching call as I get to hang out with you both that's that's that's, that's wonderful and, and I'll tell you uh, yeah, that's that's wonderful Nicola and I'll tell you, we, we're very, we're, uh, uh, this journey, in, in this journey of life, uh, we're not very far along the road. And uh, it, it, it might seem to you that we're, <laughs> that we're farther along the road than we really are because we're just having to learn the things that you just that you just talked about Nicola we're, we're having to learn about the possibility of hope and 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 we're having to learn that that hope uh, lifts people's spirits so we can see the, the, the benefit of hope. And the way we have to find it is through uh, surrender. And that seems like a non sequitur, but it, but it isn't because it, it's your committed commitment to strife in my commitment to strife that keeps us from moving to a higher level and so does that given what you just said there for both of you like does this understanding does the principles understanding does it mean that you guys never feel hopelessness there's not a feeling that you could mention that I don't feel on a regular basis. Yeah. But my feelings mean something to me completely different than they used to. My feelings always used to mean something about my kids, my situation, the amount of work I had, what's going on around me. And now my feelings, when I feel any kind of tension, it's like an alarm going off telling me that I'm now caught up in my thinking in a way that's not helpful. It's keeping alive this feeling of tension. Because when I completely relax, the tension goes away. And I used to think that's escaping life or running away from life. It's the opposite. I'm running fully into the heart of life. When I fall out of my heaviness, the thoughts that burden me, it's a dropping into this presence, which is so ordinary. It's a, cities say it's a thought away. 
It's so simple. People don't know. It's always right here. When we're engaged in our intellect, you can't find it. When you surrender your intellect just for a moment, you just drop into the now. You touch that space inside. And he said, if you really touch that space beyond your thinking just for a moment, something beautiful must come into you must. He said it with so much passion. It was one of the last talks he ever gave. It must bring something beautiful into you. And it's a shift. That's that shift that I was talking about. Suddenly we're touching our spiritual nature. We're newness and freshness and possibility and wisdom and love and compassion lie. So now tension is friendlier than it's ever been. It's like, thank God, when I feel tension, it's just letting me know it's time to surrender, to let go of everything I'm thinking, to just relax, to be ordinary, to come back to the now, and then just rest in that unknown. Rest there. And that's where the magic for me happens. Then it's just ordinary as can be. Every day, all during the day, I have all of those feelings, but now they're friendly reminders of wisdom. Stress is a call to wisdom for me. All right, I did a talk on that uh, at one of the conferences, stress. When you understand the nature of stress, it's just our own thought-created experience. You begin to let go of more and more of the thoughts that burden us, that stress us, that keep us heavy, keep us from getting refreshed and renewed in spirit. Well, you did, Nicola. I was pondering that question that you asked. Uh, I, I do, I do get hopeless. And the only thing that I have going for me, and, and I don't always have this going for me, but when I get hopeless, the only thing I have going for me is that I, I understand that, it's, that the only thing that's happening is hopelessness. So I might stay in that hopeless state for X amount of time. But even as I'm feeling those feelings of hopelessness, I'm, I'm, uh, oh, what, what happened here? It's fine, I've, I've done it. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm, uh, like Dickens says, I'm, I know there's something else happening. Hmm. And that's something else really uh, matters to me. And though something that's happen that is happening uh, might it might take a while for me to get through it. But I do see lights at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. We've got some questions that have come up. So people are putting yeah. their hands up to right. ask questions if if you guys I just could just sit and listen listen to you talking all day. Uh, you know, and oh and you guys are going to be doing, just before I open up to questions, I just want to let people know that um George and Dickin are doing I'm just getting the the link actually and I'll share that in the chat. Um, George and Dickin are doing three days, is it, guys? Yeah, three days of just carrying on talking like this. I mean, talk about a beautiful experience for the soul, right? Like, I'm, I'm totally here for three days now, and we, we, I know we have to go to questions, but I've put a link in there. It's in 24th of September, I think, you're doing it? Next Thursday afternoon, Nick, and goes Thursday afternoon... West Coast time, Friday and Saturday, but we're, the recordings are going to be available for anybody for a whole month, Wonderful. anybody who's part of the program. Okay, and that, that 
the, the topic is wisdom, wisdom, the universal change agent. And that's, I guess, before we go to questions, you know, we talked about the name of this, this call is, is wisdom's hope. Mm. And from what I'm hearing, what you're saying, wisdom, hope, they can almost be interchangeable, those words. What, what's the wisdom part to your mind? Let's uh, go on to the questions. I'm interested in what the questions are. Okay, let's do that. So I've got Anne who's had a hand up right from the beginning. So let me see if I can unmute her. Hi, Anne. Oh, hi. Is it Hello. Me? Yeah, it's you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I cannot tell you how honoured I am to be part of this. It was like a miracle coming into my inbox. And I have known all of your work through Michael Neal. I, I followed Michael Neal from 2002 and I've been able to enjoy Dickin and, and uh, George so much and more recently you. So thank you. Oh, <laughs> such a pleasure to have you here. Oh, so goodness, I can't even believe it. <laughs> so all of what you're saying with Dickin and George, I really understand it with the intellect. For nine years now, since Michael Neal picked up the three principles, I've understood intellectually. And I don't have any doubts at all that everything he's saying is right, but it's not coming from inside me. So I don't get to that place because my mind is so busy and I don't want it to be. And I try, which is no use at all, trying to not have a busy mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, I've done it where I just say, forget all that. I'm facing in the right direction. So don't do anything. Just carry on with life facing in the right direction. I still don't do that. So like, I'll give you an example. I felt so alone and I do this sometimes. I'm never really alone. I've got a huge social, I've lots of friends, family. But, you know, a feeling of, real deep down loneliness hits me sometimes like I'm alone in the world not really but I realize it's my soul longing for itself I think I heard that phrase somewhere so in other words that that you're discussing and I totally know is there that I could drop into if only the busyness would would give me a break but I don't know how to I can't surrender even though I want to Oh, yeah. and, and I can tell you, you surrender way more than you realize because yeah. when you're present, you're surrendered. When you're feeling good, you're surrendered. When you right. relax. When you're just relaxed and being yourself as you are at any moment, even if you're feeling horrible. Yeah. We're either paying attention to our thinking or we're just looking around and we see people and we see trees and we see the birds and we hear our voice and people people don't know you can't be in the now unless you've surrendered oh right okay because otherwise otherwise people are looking for something that it's impossible to find and this is the opposite it's too ordinary too simple and too available for people to find because the intellect thinks it can't be that simple can't be that available yeah. <laughs> can't, can't be right here it must be something like really sometimes people think spiritual is like really an altered state of mind rather than our most natural ordinary mind yeah so it's it's so, more available than you think. If if you're fully present, your mind might still be busy, but you're also seeing trees and people and it doesn't make any difference what's going on in your mind then. See, I don't I don't I don't think that it I I think everybody's mind is more busy than they they would say is ideal. I know mine is when people talk about, oh, George, you're so, your mind is so quiet. Well, it doesn't look quite quiet to me. Oh, all right. <laughs> you know, it doesn't look quite to, to me, but it does seem like there's a presence that's, that I can bring to the, to the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
should I just carry on then? Just, just yeah, do it. Yeah, just, I can't yeah. do any better. <laughs> well, I mean, my, my, my guess is that you're, uh, and this would be true of me, I think you're too hard on yourself the same way that I feel like I'm hard on myself. And, and what it is, is I don't have gratitude, enough gratitude for what I, for know, what I'm, what I know and what I've seen. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm going on a lear learning curve about that. Oh, well, I will too, definitely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. I'm deeply grateful and feel honored. Thank you. You. you know a word that Sid used for surrender that helped me a lot? He, he would say, true listening. Because you, you can't think and listen at the same time. So when I'm fully present, it's just an ordinary state of listening. And then everything starts flowing. And everything... There's hope because you know everything is going to flow and pass when we're present. When we're caught up, it doesn't flow. True. <laughs> right? So when it's flowing, it doesn't matter how much is flowing through us. All yeah. this all this thinking, all this busyness. George, you used to call this being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Oh. <laughs> in other words, when we're in low moods, we're either thinking hard, Oh, we're just present to life, which is the most ordinary, natural thing, requires no effort, no tension, no striving, no trying to be somewhere better, not trying to feel better, and is just allowing, just allowing ordinary, is just the most ordinary thing in the world. I love it. That's great. Comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'm going to remember that. Yeah. As then well. it, I used to think, well, I have to be in a good mood. Well, mm. in a low mood, I can be fully present and have all kinds of hope and yeah. be open, open to life. It's, it's bigger than or beyond our moods swings that are up and down. It's like moods are like the waves on the ocean and we're talking vertical means when you go a foot below the waves there's a quiet there even though the waves are going on that's right you go a little bit deeper and the learning curve that i think we're all on is we're just getting a little more familiar and comfortable with what's right that i i love how you said it george the the space between the frames of our thinking that <laughs> I wanted to say, while I still have a chance, that I am so uh, thrilled about uh, working with you mm. these days, those days that we're together. I just think it's, you and I have such a strong uh, connection, such a strong bond. I don't know if everybody knows George, but we're neighbors. We we're right down the street from each other. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're like a, we're like a mile from each other. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and, and we worked in the same building for sixteen years, yeah. and we've known each other for thirty three years. Yeah, you know, so it's it's, but it's deeper than that. It's we, we are just couple old farts who've been stumbling around and and we have ups and downs like everybody else and we've almost everything people say they've tried to do we've tried to do you know tried to calm our minds down and tried to not have a busy mind and uh we know that as well as anybody because we <laughs> we've done it for years we probably <laughs> Longer than most people here on the call, George. So yeah. you, after a while, you just get a little inkling that when we just stop struggling, trying, working on ourselves, 
we just become ordinary and present. Or I like the word presence because to me it's it's even bigger than being present. As, yeah. as we drop into this space of quiet and feeling that embraces everything and embraces our, our moods and our thoughts and our feelings. It doesn't struggle with them. It just allows them to flow naturally. And so if you follow George and I around, you go, you guys have moods. And I say, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? That would be like saying, oh, you guys still exhale. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so George and I have spent so much time together mucking around and then getting glimpses and then sharing our insights with each other and then learning from each other. And we both have stayed at times. We become real just students where it was like we don't have a clue but we're getting more familiar or comfortable with not having a clue, not knowing. Yeah. And just say, George, I don't know. I don't have a clue. And, he, and one or the other would say, oh, that's good. You're going in the right direction now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what I love with you guys, though, like all those, well, certainly since I've been in this conversation for the last seven years, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen you both in the same room. Like I've seen you at the conferences, but teaching together. Yeah. And this, this is my first experience of you teaching together. And, you know, certainly I'm going to come along to the event that you're doing, because to me, it's like a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like when else am I going to get, well, hopefully many times in the future. Right. But like, I've never had a chance to see you guys together. And especially for like three whole days to yeah. me, that's like, I don't know how you take this, but like to me, that's as close to the source of Sid as I can get, right? Like in terms of spending time with you guys, as well as, you know, the other people that have been around Sid, but to have both of you together and there's something magical that happens when the two of you hang out together because you have that connection. The, the warmness, that, that connection underneath, like there can't be a person on this call that isn't, doesn't feel that warmth listening to you. And, and, that warmth is the feeling of hope. It's the very thing that you're talking about arises in us as you two hang out and we get to be there as you do it. It's a very in your bones experience, that experience of hanging out with both of you. Wakes Thank up the thing that you're talking about in us as we listen. Yeah, it's very kind of you to say that. Well, it's just true. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Have you, would you guys mind answering? We've got one, we've got a few questions, but can I ask you, ans ask you to answer one more? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Let me open up. So I've got Tom is next in the queue and I apologize to those of you. I know I've got lots of people messaging me on the chat. I've got lots of people um, with their hands up as well and asking me questions. And I'm sorry we won't get to all of you. Um, come along to the event if you can. You'll have three days to quiz these guys on anything and everything. Um, Tom, let me come to you. Hi, Tom. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hey, Tom. Hi, everyone. I, um, first of all, just thank you so much, everyone, for, for doing this. And I just wanted to say very briefly the, what happened to me with, with hope, that the principles gave, gave me, me hope because I saw that every time I was disturbed by something, you know, when I saw it, that it was going to go away. And probably, you know, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And so hope became something that I used to just dismiss completely, mm -hmm. like thinking it was wishful thinking yeah. to becoming a fact in my life as strong. It's, as, it's the same as gravity. Every time in my life I have felt bad, it has been followed by, by coming back to feeling better. Every time, you know, millions of times. I, and I still, like you guys, I get depressed and anxious every day but what happened to me about a year ago is I went from having a diagnosis of major depression and believing I was depressed to just seeing that every day I have a hundred maybe a thousand depressive thoughts that that go away on their own and I come back to whatever this is so and you especially you and Dick Dickon and George I watched so many of your videos when I was going through this horrible 
what I mm. thought was a horrible time. And it was so helpful to me. And I, if nothing else, I, at some point in my life, I wanted to be able to meet you guys and just mm. tell you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you've shared. It's been so transformative to me. I'm so overwhelmed with gratitude. Well, that's very heartfelt, what you just said. Very heartfelt. And I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it's great hearing about what you've learned that's really helped you with going through your down times. That's great, Tom. Thank you. I mean, there, there, there hasn't been a day uh, that, I, that I have a, in a, or a moment when I haven't felt like I was a fraud. I felt like uh, every every once in a while I'll feel like, what am I teaching? What am I doing being a teacher of, of consciousness? And, and and that's my form of hopelessness is I, I'll feel like a fraud. I'll feel like, gee, I shouldn't really be in front of this room here. They got the wrong guy. But even in those moments, I, I think I feel like I'm I'm a little bit full of shit when I'm when I'm saying that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. That was such a lovely note to end on. And George and Dickin, I just want to say a big heartfelt thank you. This has been such a treat for me and you know, we'll send the recording out to everybody and so everyone else can get to hear it that didn't make it onto the call mm. today. But everyone's saying a big thank you in the chat and how helpful this has been. So um, yeah. that's lovely. And, and I'll, I'll send around a link. When I send the recording out, I'll send a link to the event with that as well. So if you've missed it in the chat, because I know some people don't know how to use the chat, then don't worry, it'll be on the email that comes out to you tomorrow. So you can have a look at that as well. And we will send the recording out so you can watch it back again. How cool is that? So thank you, George. Thank you, Dickin. I hope I get to speak to you again soon. And thank you for taking the time to come and spend time with us all tonight or today in your time. Well, well thank you, Nicola. My pleasure. I, I, that was, you did a great job and thanks, thanks for doing that for us. You're very, very welcome. My pleasure. And like I said, I got my own personal coaching session as well. <laughs> yeah. I feel very lucky. <laughs> Thank you, George. Nick, Thank you. Nick, I love being with you, and I, I appreciate all that you're doing, and I love seeing the pictures on Facebook with bouquets bigger than a house, and yeah. uh, only you have arms big enough to wrap around them all and, and continue to share that beauty with the people. Uh, now it's spread all through England, right? You have like 700 people doing flowers for people in need. Yeah. Everyone with their arm full. Next summer, everyone will have their arms full of flowers. Everyone's growing them at the moment. You wait till next summer, Facebook is going to be a wash with arms full of flowers. Awesome. <laughs> well, Hi, guys. Enough, enough chat of flowers, although that will keep me going for another hour. And uh, I'll speak to you both soon. Take very good care of yourself. And thank you to everyone that came along tonight as well. It was lovely to have you. Uh, Thanks, take everybody. care, everybody. Thank you, George. Thank you, Dickon. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much.